We're talking about how you analyze or structure a play. And when last we were together, I was talking about, and just to you know, bring you up to speed, two main characters in a play, the protagonist and the antagonist. Protagonist is the most important, antagonist is the second most important. Protagonist we know the most about, antagonist we know the second most about. Protagonist makes all the choices in the play, all the decisions that drive the action of the play. Makes all the decisions that drives the action of the play. When plays begin, we have lots of this stuff, exposition. Now exposition continues throughout the play, but no play begins without starting with exposition. I was talking um, with my directing class today, and uh, somebody lost a check. Wow. And um, I was saying that a lot of movies that you'll see today will start with action. And when we think back to the ancient Greeks, they started with a lot of talking. They talked a lot. And they would give you this information. But films today have gotten so good and it's because audiences won't sit through a lot of talking. You want, if you go to a movie, you want action. You want to see car chases. You want to see battles. You want to see people doing stuff, not talking about it. And I, I mentioned in my class, I said, and I'll just ask in here, how many of you saw the film The Avengers? A lot of you. If you didn't see it, you know what it's about, right? Anybody just totally clueless? I've never heard of that. Okay, good. But if you look at some, something like the Avengers, the Avengers begins with action. Stuff's happening. And yet, that action is nothing more than exposition. Through the action, they give you backstory. They tell you a little bit about who these characters are and where they came from. For example, um, Scarlett Johansson plays what character? Natasha Romanoff. Natasha Romanoff, the Black Widow. And her job is what? Assassin. She's an assassin and a spy. Now, if you've never read the comic books, you might not know that. But they set it up pretty damn quick that you'll figure it out. The first time we see her, she's sitting in this room, and these Russian guys are beating her up, and she's tied to a chair. And they're, they're giving her hell, saying, you're not a very good spy. We got all the information. The information you have is old. What really happened was, and they start telling her, while they're beating her up. A lot of action. But what it's telling us, she's a spy. <laughs> she's gathering information. She runs around with guys doing espionage. And finally, what I love in that movie, the phone rings. And the guy picks up the phone. Who is this? We've got a missile aimed at your building. If you don't let us talk to her, we're going to blow the shit out of you. Oh, for you. <laughs> and then she starts, don't call me at the office, I'm working. You need to come in. Oh, okay. And then she just proceeds to beat these guys to pieces, like five of them. Does a nice flip in a chair, breaks the chair, uses that to help beat them up. And then she picks up the phone again. I'm on my way. <laughs> and in that little sequence, we learn a lot about her and what's going on. You've got to go see the big guy. Of course, the big guy turns out to be who? Huh? 
The Hulk. She's now got to go interview the Hulk. It's all, it's all exposition. Nothing's happened yet. Even though there's a lot of action. Does that make sense? Exposition, I'm getting information that I need to understand the play, to understand what's going on in the story. That's all exposition is. And it continues throughout the whole play, throughout the whole movie. You keep being re-reminded. They tell you some more stuff. You got this. Now let's tell you a little bit more that you need to know of this background information. Finally, in a story though, in a play, and I was talking about the Scottish play, Macbeth. Finally, at some point, the protagonist makes a decision. And that decision sets the play in motion. We call that decision the first crisis, the precipitating act. It's the first crisis of a play. It's a decision made by the protagonist and it sets the play in motion. Alright, I'm going to get back to telling my story about Macbeth. Macbeth, Macbeth. The Scottish play. I hope the roof doesn't fall in on me. Okay. In Macbeth, we learn a lot. There's a lot of exposition. I talked about this last time. Macbeth the general, he's put down a rebellion, yada, 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 yada. And I ended this with talking about he finally gets invited to the king's house. He thinks he's next in line to be king. The king looks at him, goes, Macbeth, love you, babe. Did a great job. Banquo, you did good too. Love you guys. Thank you for saving my kingdom. I'm giving the next in line to be king will be my son, Malcolm. Malcolm's not here today. My son, Malcolm. And Macbeth gets upset. Because he is expecting to be named next. And the witches have told him, you're going to be king. And he writes a letter to his wife. And he tells her what has happened. And then there's a scene after that. We meet Macbeth's wife. She has a real funny name, Lady Macbeth. They didn't even give her a name, just Lady Macbeth. Call her Julie, I don't know. Julie Macbeth. And she gets his letter and she goes, she's reading it, she reads it to the audience, and she goes, so the king's coming here to our house to party. He'll never leave. And just so happens, Macbeth shows up. Macbeth walks in. She, they hug. Uh, they talk to each other. You find out that you know, these two really are in love. And she says, husband, I love you, but you're weak. You need a little more backbone. Do you love me? Well, yeah, baby. Well, if you love me, you'll kill that king. I don't know if I can do it. Well, then you're not a man. A man would kill it. Man takes what he wants. You must be a boy. And Macbeth goes, I'll do it. I'll do it for you, honey. Well, you better, you ain't, mm, this is off limits. <laughs> and he goes, I'll do it. King shows up, they have a party. Macbeth questions whether or not he's going to do this. He has a soliloquy to the audience. And then he says, by God, I'm going to do it. And he does. He kills, he makes the decision to kill the king. When he makes the decision to kill the king, there ain't no turning back. That's the precipitating act. Once he kills the king, makes the decision to kill the king, he can't turn the clock back. He can't go back to go and start over. The play is in motion now. Make sense? Hope my story's not boring you too badly.
It's the real short version of, of Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. All right. In plays, we'll get some more exposition. The play continues to grow, though. Macbeth kills the king. All kinds of stuff happens. He also kills his best friend Banquo because the witches have said Banquo's children will be kings. And Macbeth goes, uh-uh, my children are going to be kings. And so he kills his best friend. He tries to kill his son, who's just a little boy, but it, they miss. The murderers miss. They don't kill the son. Finally, the play builds and builds and builds and builds. It builds in action. And about halfway through a play, we have the second crisis. And the second crisis has a real technical name. Major crisis. The major crisis. It's the second It's the second crisis in a play. It's a decision made by who? The protagonist. And it sends the play towards the final crisis. It's always about halfway through a play. Or a little past halfway. But now the play is going directly towards the final and most important crisis, the biggest crisis, which I'll talk about in just a second. In Macbeth, Macbeth kills Banquo, he kills the king. At a party, after, Mac, after Banquo is killed, they're having a party and all the thanes, all the lords of the country come to the party because Macbeth has now been made king. When he, was, when he was crowned king, when, after he killed the, the, the king, he made it look like the king's sons did it. And the king's sons had to flee the country. They go, one goes to England and one goes to, to Ireland. And since the sons are gone, Macbeth is made king. And so they have a big party to celebrate that. And at the party... I love how Shakespeare does this. At the party, the ghost of his buddy, Banquo, shows up. But only Macbeth can see him. And he's all covered with blood, and he looks at Macbeth and basically asks him why he did it. And Macbeth freaks out. He sees a bloody ghost of his best friend that he just had killed. And he starts talking to it. And he forgets that everybody else is in the party. Goes, I'm sorry I killed you, Banquo. <laughs> and all these other people I've killed. And, and his wife shuts him up. <laughs> says, you, are you crazy? <laughs> and she orders everybody out of the party. She says, oh, he he's just hadn't had much sleep. He doesn't feel good. And he's just talking. He, he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> this happens sometimes. Get out. She orders everybody out of the party. And he, he's freaking out now. He's seeing ghosts and he's, he's starting to, to go crazy. And he, he needs a, a helping hand, so he goes back to visit the witches. There are three witches, and he goes to see the witches. And the witches tell him two things. They say, no one can harm Macbeth that's born of woman. Macbeth thinks about that, and that's pretty good odds. People, everybody's born of a woman. I'm pretty safe. And they tell him something else. They say, don't worry until Burnham Wood moves on the castle. And Beth, Macbeth goes, trees can't move. Hey, I am good. Nobody's going to hurt me. And he comes back from the witches, and one of his men rides up and says, Macbeth, you know the Lord Macduff? Macduff was at the party, and he heard you speak. And he's not happy with the things that you're doing. 
and he thinks that you might be guilty of killing the king. And he left the country and he's going to England to meet with Malcolm, the old king's son. And they're going to try to get the British army to join them and attack this country and kill you. Take, take the country back over. And Macbeth blows a fuse. He goes crazy. And he says, all right, you go to his house. You take some men. You go to his house. You kill his wife. You kill his dog, his cat, his kids. Anybody that's there, take them out. Take them down. I want them dead. And if he's there, kill him. Make sure you kill him. His men go over there and take care of business. They not only kill his wife, they rape her, kill her, kill the kids, kill the servants, they kill everybody. Just so happens Macduff's already left the house. Macduff's gone to England. And Shakespeare, being a good writer, turns around in the next scene, we see him meeting with Malcolm, the, the, king's for, the, the old king's son. And he says, Malcolm, I think you're a weakling. He's a little teenager. I don't think I should join you. He says, I hate Macbeth, but at least he's a strong soldier. So I'm not sure. Tell me why I should join you. So we learn that he, he, hasn't, he didn't make a decision to join Malcolm. Macbeth didn't have to kill his family. Now, I don't know if any of you people know any Scottish people, but they tend to have tempers. Macduff has a bad one. And one of his cousins rides up and says, I got terrible news to tell you. Your whole family's just been murdered. Who did it? Macbeth. And Macduff whips out his sword, big broad claymore, and he says, I'm going to kill Macbeth, I'll join you Malcolm, but you leave Macbeth to me because I'm going to kill him with my bare hands. Macbeth's decision to kill Macduff's family is the major crisis. There is no turning back. And he set up the, the final crisis, which we call the climax. The climax is, again, a decision made by the protagonist, and it's the moment of highest action in the play. The moment of highest action in the play. The whole play is building up to that moment. And it's a crisis. It's the biggest crisis. The moment of highest action in the play. Okay. Good writers, whether it's a novel or whether it's a, a play, but especially in a play, good writers will have what we call twists. And a twist is where we expect something to happen and then something else happens. We don't get what we expect. It's a twist. It's a twist in the plot. And there's a special kind of twist that I want you to remember. And it's called a dark, bright scene. Dark, bright scene. The dark bright scene is a, is a twist that happens between the major crisis and the climax. Happens in here. It's a twist between the major crisis and the climax. In a, in a tragedy or a drama, it's where we think everything's going to be okay. Because in a tragedy, everything will never end okay. But for a moment, we think everything's going to be okay. And then there's a twist, and then the rug's pulled out from the feet of the protagonist, 
and we reach the climax. Okay? Um, you'll see twists a lot in horror movies. Any of you ever see a Alien? It's one of my favorites. I like science fiction stuff, but I liked Alien a lot. In Alien, all the way through, you're expecting something to happen and then that damn alien jumps out. And you're not expecting it. The Freddy Krueger movies are that way too. How many times do you think Freddy's dead? Or Michael Myers. How many times do you think that you know he's dead and then all of a sudden he jumps up? My, I like the, the, the alien movie because Sigourney Weaver, is, it's the first one. Sigourney Weaver, we think, has killed the alien. Everybody else is dead. She's by herself. And she gets into a, a, an escape pod <laughs> to get away from the alien. And she's in the escape pod and she's going to go to sleep for long space travel. And, I mean, the, the, the movie makers really go overboard on this. She's in her little pajama, her little negligee. She has a kitten. She found a kitten. She has her little kitten. And she's, oh, the little kitten. And I'm getting ready to go to sleep. And that bad old alien's gone. And you and I are the only two that lived. And this drool falls. <laughs> and she looks up and the alien's sitting up there. He's gotten in the pod with her. I want to tell you, when I first saw that movie, I had to clean them pants out almost. <laughs> uh, that, that, that got me. But the, the, the dark, bright scene was her with the kitten. They set you up. They, oh, it's going to be good. She, every, the, I thought the movie was over. The music was even play. It was all happy. And the big old thing of drool. And that thing had double mouths, and they're opening up. Ooh, scary stuff, boys and girls. Okay? In Macbeth, what they do for you in Macbeth is, Macbeth, uh, after, after Macduff's family's killed, he gets word that the British army is coming over to Scotland, and a bunch of the thanes have the thanes or the, or the lords have joined Malcolm and the british are going to help them get Malcolm back to power and take take out Macbeth but Macbeth has heard from the witches and the witches told him good stuff no one can harm me that's born of woman and don't worry until the trees when burnham wood starts moving only then do you have to worry so there's a scene, he's, he's talking, uh, he, he loves his wife, he, he figures he and his wife will have children, everything's going to be okay, nobody can harm me, so if they're coming, it guarantees us a victory. We'll just sit here in this castle, and they'll never get in, and we'll win the war. And then all of a sudden, Shakespeare is a good writer, all of a sudden, boom, a guy comes out and goes, Sir, your wife just committed suicide. The guilt, there's some guilt. We don't know what it was, but she's dead. Macbeth, oh man. And then this second guy comes running up and goes, Macbeth, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but I was on guard up there on the wall, and trees are walking towards the castle. And Macbeth says, I'll kill you if you're telling me a lie. What are, you, what are you talking about? He says, no, trees are coming towards the castle. What has happened is the British have cut down a bunch of, of limbs to hide their approach. And they're stealthily moving upon the castle. And their, their plan is that when they get close enough that they can rush the castle, they'll drop the limbs and take off running to the ca and attack the castle. So it looks like the woods is moving on the castle. Which has warned him of that. Macbeth says, well, they're all born a woman. Let's fight. And in comes who but Macduff. Macduff 
turns to Macbeth. I'm not going to do all the Shakespeare words for you. But he basically tells him, let's fight. And Macbeth stops says, no, I, I've taken enough of your family's blood already. I don't want to kill you too. You see, I live a charmed life. No one born of woman can hurt me. And Macduff looks at him and goes, I'm from me mother's womb untimely ripped. In other words, she had a, he was, was not born. He was, it was a C-section. He was pulled out of the belly. Exactly. And Macbeth goes, oh shit. <laughs> but being a good hero, being a, a warrior, he makes a decision. And that decision's what? He doesn't kill himself. His decision is to do what? Fight. That's the climax of the play. It's his final decision. And they have, a, they have a heck of a fight. Big broadsword battle at the end of the play. That's the climax of the play. But it's even knowing that he's going to lose, Macbeth chooses to fight. In fact, Macduff gives him a chance not to. He says, hey, Macbeth, I don't want, I'll tell you what, you don't have to fight me. Let me put you in a cage on wheels and we'll roll you around the country and show everybody what a tyrant looks like. And they can throw tomatoes and stuff at you. And Macbeth weighs his options and says, no, I won't kneel at the ground of Malcolm's feet. Fight on, Macduff. Lay on, Macduff's what he says. And they fight. There's a big fight. He is killed. Macbeth is killed. Macduff cuts off his head, puts it on a pike, brings it in and presents it to the new king, Malcolm. And Malcolm, the very end of the play, invites the audience, as though they're in the play, come see me crowned at Scone. And the play ends. The end of a play has a name. It's a French word, it's not mared. Denouement. Not denouement. I know somebody, ah, denouement. <laughs> ah, that's the denouement. They have a denouement at the end of play. Ah, damn. Ah, ah, ah. I like denouements. <laughs> After dinner, I have denouements. <laughs> No, it's a denouement. The denouement is all that means. It's French. It just, we wrap up the story. We tie up all the loose ends. And usually in the denouement, the message is given. Here's what you should have learned by watching this for two and a half hours. I always get mad at introduction to theater students who leave early because they miss the denouement and they don't know what the play was about. <laughs> if you stay for that, it'll, they'll tell you. The denouement. Um, almost all plays are structured this way. Almost all films are structured this way. There could be slight differences, but Pretty much this is how, how a play is structured. And if you understand that, you can watch a movie and sometimes figure out what's going to happen by understanding what the structure is. Now, what's a plot? Can anybody tell me what a plot is other than ground, not, a, you know, not like a plot of ground? What's a plot in, in theater and film? It's the story. The plot is the story. And 
when I was in school, I had a teacher that was, that was teaching us this, and at that time, she, she told us there were only three possible plots. And she was wrong. There, there are four. And if you can come up with another one, I'd like to hear it. But the three plots, or the four plots, are man or woman, man or woman, versus man or woman. In other words, human versus human. That's one type of plot. Man or woman versus God. That's another kind of plot. Man or woman versus nature. They were the three that I was given. And the newest one is man or woman versus machine. And when we say machine, nowadays that refers to computers and the internet and that sort of thing. I can't, I don't know of any other plots, but almost all stories are one of those. What about man versus society? Man versus society is, is man versus man. Um, because there are a lot of those. God versus God? Well, but there's a guy in it who's not a God. Yeah, it's man versus God. Man versus God. Yeah, I mean, it could be, you know, throughout history there have been many gods. It can be any of them. Yeah, either, most aliens or monsters either come from nature or they're made by man. Or they're made by the gods in some way. So, yeah. That's man versus man. There are a lot of stories that are that. Yeah. But, that's a good point, but aren't they like human animals? I mean, yeah, it's a fish, but it's not. They're treated like humans. They speak English. They don't, they don't speak fish. They, Disney does that all the time. It's a rat. Yeah, Mickey Mouse. But it's a, you know, it's a rat that wears clothes. Kind of. I laughed a few years back when, uh, I forgot what country it was, they banned Donald Duck because he didn't have pants. <laughs> he, was, he was censored. They were real worried, but he, he's not wearing pants. And I think Disney actually did a special thing where they put pants on him. He had like little shorts. <laughs> Donald Duck. But they're human, I mean they're treated like humans, right? Okay. Um, any questions about the structure of a play? About any of this? Does this make sense? A lot of the things you watch this semester, you're going to have to apply this to what you watch and figure out these things to what you watch. That's going to be part of what our tests are going to be. Okay, but we'll talk about them. All right, let's now jump. It's similar, but it's a new topic. And we're going to talk about tragedy. Tragedy is one of the first dramatic forms um, in the world. 
that we know of. And it's been around, um, well, it's in Greece it started, the first tragedies were written around the 5th century BC. But we know that there were tragedies uh, written in Egypt before that. Uh, the only problem with the, the Egyptian stories is we don't know, we don't have the scripts. We do have a number of scripts still around that were written in the 5th century BC in Greece. And what happened with, with uh, the theater in both Greece and in um, Egypt? Theater developed out of their religion. And that's important. It developed out of their religion. And it was ritual. And it helped to tell the stories of their heroes and their gods. In the beginnings, told by priests. Later, told by, every, by playwrights who created stories and told them. But the performances, if you go back to the Greek theaters, and you still can, there's a number of Greek theaters still around, actually were took place and they kept the altar where at one time the priest would have stood where they performed their 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 uh, uh, worship ceremonies and certain things take place in these stories um, that we can look at and say okay that's tragedy um, In tragedy, there is never a happy ending. It's always going to end bad for the protagonist. And the people that go to see it know that. The characters in these ancient tragedies are always of noble birth. That's important to remember. They're always of noble birth. There are no Greek tragedies about Joe the garbage man. Unless he's Joe the garbage man who used to be prince of Egypt. <laughs> they are of noble birth. They come from noble families. And that's, that's very important. It's a very important part of what these stories are. The protagonist in a classic tragedy is a great and good person. They are a great and good person. But, bum, 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 they have a tragic flaw. They're a great and good person, but they have a tragic flaw. Okay, what does that mean? Um, take example Macbeth. Though Macbeth's not a, a Greek tragedy, since I just spent a whole lot of time telling you the story. Shakespeare wrote tragedies, and it's a Shakespearean tragedy. Um, he's of noble birth, and in the beginning of the play, we, we learn that he is a great general, and he's been very loyal to the king, been very loyal to his wife, loyal to his friends. He's a good guy. So, so he's a great person. He's good. But the problem with Macbeth is his ambition is misguided. He wants things, and he wants them now. And what he wants is ultimate power. 
He has too much ambition or misguided ambition. And because of that, he does terrible things. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying here? So it's a great and good person who has a tragic flaw, and this flaw is what will destroy them. And at the end of the play, they will be destroyed. Or it's not a tragedy. Okay. Why did the, why did the Greeks or the Egyptians or Shakespeare write something like this? Why do we have tragedies? What they wanted to do was to arouse in the audience fear and pity. To arouse the emotions of fear and pity. In other words, by watching one of these plays, it should scare you a little bit. A great and good person is capable of doing this. And I should feel a little sorry for them. They had everything and they lost it. Now, think about the people who went to see the plays, who went to see the tragedies. Most of the people, ancient Greece, ancient um, Egypt, are poor. They live pretty horrible lives, hard lives. They work hard. They have to survive. It's hard for them. And you're sitting there and you start feeling sorry about yourself. Man, I live a hard life. I'm a shepherd. I got to go out here with these sheep, live in the hot sun. I don't know if I'm going to make enough money, if the sheep are going to live. I don't know if my family is going to survive. Life is hard. Well, honey, let's go to see the tragedies. When they would do festivals, they would go to these festivals and see a whole bunch of these. It would be a whole day of them. And in each tragedy, these great and good people would fall. And you'd go, my life sucks, but it's not that bad. I feel pretty good. Let's go have dinner. Have dinner and a show. But it's to arouse fear and pity, and then in the end, make me feel better about myself. Make me feel better about life. And the Greeks wrote some pretty wild tragedies, let me tell you. Um, some other things that I want you to remember about the characters. Um, we've already said that it's a great and good person. Um, in these plays, the leading character or characters are caught in a situation that they can't do anything about. So the fates have, have done something to them. And one of the things that makes it interesting is watching how they deal with that. Because they usually learn they can't do anything about it. So what are you going to do? For example, Macbeth could have taken Macduff's offer to surrender and be put in a cage. Or he can fight, go out as he was, a warrior. And what does he choose? Chooses to be the warrior. So he goes out okay. But he knows he's not going to win. He's caught in a situation he knows he can't do anything about. So, you see, understand what I'm saying? And all these characters are that way. Um, they also accept the responsibility for what they've done. These are, in the long run, these are good people. So in the end, they don't cop a plea. <laughs> I did it. I killed all those people. Let's fight. I know you're going to kill me, but let's fight. So they accept responsibility. They... they, they, they own up to the truth. And also, lastly, these plays are written in verse.
which the Greeks and Shakespeare thought of, if I was writing poetry, or writing in verse, it's a higher form of language than if I put it in the vernacular, if I talk the way we talk. And so the characters speak in verse. In fact, in Shakespeare's time, some of the characters don't speak in verse, and usually they're the comic characters, they're co and they're commoners. And then the, the wealthy, the nobles, all speak in verse. And that's how you distinguish them sometimes. Okay. We still have tragedies around with us today. Um, there are two major differences in our tragedies that are written now. Tragedy, modern tragedies, stuff that has been written since the, like the beginning of the 20th century, um, the two big differences are they are common people and the other one is they're not written in verse. They're, they're just written as we speak. But they still are tragedies. We did one here not too long ago. Uh, we did Death of a Salesman. And Death of a Salesman is a modern tragedy. I'm not going to ask that on a test. But it's about a guy that's a door-to-door -door salesman. I mean, it's just a common guy. And he has all the other qualities, except he's not noble. And at the end, he dies. I mean, and nothing good happens to him. Huh? Spoiler alert. Oh, spoiler alert. Sorry. Okay. Um, any questions about, about this? What was the second kind of tragedy called? Just modern tragedy. Yeah. Modern tragedy. Okay. Okay. Um, there were three Greek writers uh, that we, that are, whose works are still around. Ancient Greek writers. I'm jumping back a little bit, but I'm setting you up for the next class. And um, there's Sophocles, Aeschylus, and Euripides. The last of these three, Euripides, let me write his name up here. I'm not going to ask you about those other guys. Euripides is my favorite of, of the Greeks. And the reason I like Euripides is his plays are easier to understand because the situations, even though they're about heroes and gods, a lot of the characters in the plays are going through situations similar to people today. You can, you can, you can make real easy correlations with what they're going through. For example, the play that we're going to watch next class is called Medea. How many of you know the play Medea? Anybody? So this is going to be a, a fairly new experience for most of you. How do you, do you know it? I ain't talking about the, uh, the new Medea, though the, the name is taken from this Medea. No, that's different. That's not, even, that's a, that's not a tragedy. Uh, unless you have to deal with her. Um, Medea is a, is a really cool story, and it comes out of, of, out of the Greek mythology. Have you heard of Jason? Jason and the Argonauts? Any of you? That story's been around a lot. There's been a lot of movies made about Jason. Uh, Medea it, it tells the story of what happens to Jason after he returns uh, to Greece. And he, while he is gone, uh, and I'll, I'll explain some of this, and uh, you'll, see, you'll know it when you see the play. But what happens is Jason goes off to another country to find the Golden Fleece. 
And he's been told by the king that he has to find the golden fleece. So he goes and he hears it's in this country called Colchis. And he goes to Colchis and he learns that the people there are ruled by a family that practices black magic. And that if he's not careful, they're going to do him in. That they know lots of magic. And he's a hero and he decides that what he wants to do is he's, he goes to Colchis, uh, he lands his ship, the Argo, on its shores, and he goes in to meet the king of Colchis, and he tells him that he wants the Golden Fleece. Now this is a problem because they worship the Golden Fleece. And they don't want to give it up. But he's been told he has to bring it back home. He has to bring it back to his country. And the king decides, since Jason is of noble birth, not to kill him right off the bat. But he says, you must accomplish certain tests. And if you accomplish these tests, you can have the Golden Fleece. Of course, each one of these tests is, has to do with fighting monsters. And Jason says, okay. Now, what's cool about Jason, and one of the reasons he gets to do a lot of the things he does, is one of the gods loves him. <clears throat> Goddesses. She thinks he's hot. Hot Greek soldier. Doesn't wear a lot, wears his armor, fights, looks like he should be in 300. <laughs> Take on half the world. <coughs> She's a goddess. She thinks he's hot. She's got powers. She decides to protect him. And what she does is she puts a spell on, on Jason and he actually puts a spell on the princess of Colchis, the young, beautiful, and very dangerous Medea, Princess Medea. And Medea, when it has this spell put on her, the first man she sees, she will fall desperately in love with and do anything for anything. Forever. Who does she wake up and see? Jason. And she got some bad magic. Because she's a sorceress. And she uses her magic to help him defeat all the monsters. Not only that, she uses her magic to help him kill her father. She uses her magic to help him kill her uncle. She uses her magic to help him do in her brothers, get the Golden Fleece, and come back to Greece. That's all before this play begins. I'm just giving you the background. Guess what happens when he gets back to Greece? He's got this woman madly in love with him. By that point, they've had two kids. He gets back with the golden fleece, the king of his country that sent him out to go do all this. He goes, man, you are a hero. I want you to marry my little daughter. You'll be next in line to be king. And he's got this <coughs> foreigner, a witch, sorceress. She thinks she's his wife. And he says, Bye, babe. I'm marrying the young girl. I'm going to be king. That's where our story begins. With a woman who has killed half her family to marry this guy. And he has decided to leave her. And it's going to be fireworks, let me tell you. I'll see you next time. <laughs>